This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Today it gives me great pleasure to introduce the winner of the 2014-15 UCCS Bacon Public Lectureship and White Paper Competition. Through a generous gift from longtime UC Davis supporter Kevin Bacon, the UC Center sponsored a system-wide competition calling for proposals in three broad areas, health, water, and education. We received some very strong applications from faculty, uh, from nearly every campus in the system. And the applications were judged by a, a very strong committee that included Delane Easton, Amber Mace, Thad Kauser, Bob Brook, Ken Jacobs, and Karthik Ramakrishnan. And I'd like to give a special shout out to Karthik and his School of Public Policy at UC Riverside for preparing the policy brief, which is available to you in your packets. Uh, but when all was said and done, when the committee finished its work, the awards committee felt there was one clear winner of the competition. That person is Professor Michael Got Gottfried from UC Santa Barbara. Dr. Gottfried is assistant professor in the Gevert School of Education at UCSB, and I'm pleased to note that he will become an associate professor there starting this summer. He was an undergraduate at Stanford and received his PhD in applied economics from the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on educational policy with special interests in the economics of education, early childhood care, peer effects in elementary school, and factors affecting the high school to college transition. Much of his most notable work has analyzed these issues in terms of their effects on high needs children including immigrants, English language learners, children with special needs, and children in urban schools. He's the author uh, or co-author of numerous publications and holds many grants from the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and several foundations. Dr. Gottfried's white paper is entitled Formal versus Informal Pre-Kindergarten and School Readiness for Children in Immigrant Families, a Review of Evidence from the United States. And uh, as mentioned, it's available in the packets that were passed out to you. Please join me in welcoming the 2014-15 UCCS Bacon Lecturer, Professor Michael Godfrey. Thank you, Rich, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the UC Center in Sacramento. Thank you for Karthik at Riverside for putting together the brief. And of course, thank you, Kevin Bacon, for supporting this research. So I'm really pleased to be here today to present this year-long project, Formal versus Informal Pre-Kindergarten Care and School Readiness for Children in Immigrant Families. And while I'm presenting it today, it would be a mistake to not mention my PhD student, Hu Yan Kim, who couldn't be here to join us today because she's working on something called a dissertation, whatever that is. <laughs> but she was also a significant part of this research, so I wanted to mention her as well. So to get us started, let's talk about two trends going on in the United States and also here in California. The first trend is that we're seeing kids being placed into formal pre-kindergarten care in the year prior to kindergarten, particularly in the year prior to kindergarten. And so what I mean by formal pre-kindergarten care is center-based care or Head Start. So kids are leaving the home for something very formal. Often this is structured activities, trained providers, et cetera. Um, and some features are out-of-home centers, like I said, trained providers. There's often significant peer interaction. And there's an explicit focus on development and learning. The contrast would be informal pre-kindergarten care. This is often characterized as parents, babysitters, relatives, nannies, grandparents, et cetera. This is often in the home or a home-like setting. It's often characterized by unstructured activities, 
untrained providers, no overt focus, focus on development and learning, and potentially less peer interaction. So if you're at home with your relatives, you may not have 25 other four-year-olds. So this trend is growing. There are reasons that we suspect why this trend is going to see more kids going into formal centers. It might be a growing maternal workforce. It might be single parenting, so mom has to send the child out for care while mom goes to work. Changes to the economy, job prospects. There isn't one specific reason. This has been researched why there is this growing proportion of students going into formal pre-kindergarten care. But there isn't one single driver that we know of yet. From the National Institute of Early Childhood Research, there's been double the amount of kids in state-funded formal care between 2001 and 2012. There's also national estimates that it's grown to about 70% of kids in state-funded and non-state-funded formal care. So kids are going into formal care, and the question is, does this do anything for these kids? In other words, does it make kids more school-ready when they enter kindergarten? And by school-ready, we mean cognitive school readiness or academic school readiness. So research does show that, in general, kids are more academically school-ready when they attend formal care as opposed to staying in the home in the year before going to kindergarten. Now, as for socio-emotional, non-cognitive, psychological, developmental, whatever word you want to use, I use socio-emotional, research actually shows a negative effect for most kids, for the general population. So kids who are going into formal care in that year before kindergarten, they often have lower developmental socio-emotional outcomes as opposed to staying in the home. And again, there's research that tries to theorize on what this is happening, although we don't have a specific driver. So I mentioned that there were two trends. The second trend is that there's an increase in the number of children from immigrant families coming into the United States. By immigrant families, I mean children who are first or second generation children. This definition is derived from the literature which I put up there as well. So that's the definition that I'm going to use for the remainder of this presentation. So one issue that I think is a bigger issue than trying to decide if I should call it socio-emotional or non-cognitive is that there's no single definition for this group of children. The definition that I'm going to use is children in immigrant families, which I abbreviate as CIF for the rest of this presentation. But there are other terms that try to get at this. So the research that talks about English language learners, or dual language learners, or language minority students, or limited English proficiency. These terms are deficit-like terms. So for the present purpose of this presentation, children and immigrant families. So let's talk a little bit more about this second trend. So there we saw it with trend one that there's a growing use of formal pre-kindergarten care. The second trend is also a growing type of trend. We see that children in immigrant families are the fastest growing youth population in the United States. So the Urban Institute has this really great chart. In that chart, they show children from native-born US parents. It's a flat line. Children from immigrant parents, the line is going up. So there is a flatness of growth, so no growth, of children from US parents. The growth of children in the United States is coming from children of immigrant parents, again, first or second generation kids. In the United States, this is about 25% of all kids. In California, we obviously know this is a lot more. What's interesting about this trend is that this is not a regional trend. While there are a greater proportion in California, in Texas, in Florida, in states that you would expect to have a lot of children from immigrant families, the United States Department of Education showed a growth in, again, what they're calling ELL students, but let's extrapolate out to children in immigrant families. They showed a growth of 46% since 1998 of ELL students. So this is happening in places that traditionally didn't have children from immigrant families. So again, in the past, we might have swept away, for lack of a better term, these issues to California, Texas, Florida. And so this is a California issue. This is no longer the case. This is a national issue that there is a trend of children in immigrant families. And why is this an issue? The issue is that children from immigrant families, as a generalization, tend to be high-risk children. 
they tend to be from low SES families. They tend to lack English proficiency. They often have parents with lower educational levels. They have parents that are less knowledgeable about the US school system. And they're less likely to attend formal care, which is concerning given the academic benefits that I showed on a previous slide of going to formal kindergarten care. So what this is showing is a disproportionate risk of children from immigrant families. The second trend is we see an increased schooling gap. So if native-born students are attending formal pre-kindergarten care, they're getting experiences that other children aren't getting. So a school readiness gap emerges prior to an achievement gap in school. So given these issues, I was tasked with this study. And what this study was, was a synthesis. We're finding out what we know about what we know. So this isn't original empirical research. Instead, this is going out into the field, seeing what's been done, and coming back and reporting the findings so that we can move forward with policy and practice. So given the issues on the previous slide, we asked three questions. The first question was, in the literature, so these questions are about in the literature. In the literature, was attending formal pre-kindergarten care in the year before kindergarten linked to academic school readiness for children from immigrant families? The second question is very similar. Is attending formal pre-kindergarten care in the year before kindergarten linked to socio-emotional outcomes for school readiness for children from immigrant families? And then the third question, which often isn't asked in these types of syntheses, although I think they're really important, is what were the limitations of these studies? Not my interpretation of these limitations, but what were the limitations that the authors found? Were there, was there a commonality in these limitations? And what does that say about how we move forward? <clears throat> so taking you th quickly through the method and data. So a synthesis is a huge search of the body of literature that focused on formal versus informal care in the year before school for children from immigrant families. So we did this massive search, and I'm not going to go through all the terms on there, but the terms were divided into five categories. We had school readiness, and you can see the terms there. Academic school readiness, which is a little bit more specific. Socio-emotional school readiness pre-kindergarten, which were a ton of terms to search. And then, of course, children and immigrant families trying to be as inclusive as we could, even including those prior terms, which do have a deficit connotation. But nonetheless, those are terms that are used. So once doing this massive search, which took lots and lots of time, you have to decide which articles belong in your synthesis. We had eight criteria. The first criteria is that we wanted the articles to be published from 2004 to 2014. This was a common rubric that we saw in educational syntheses. It's an entire decade of research, the most relevant decade as it's the most recent. We didn't include any articles that were prior to 2004 in our initial search if they were cited over and over and over. So if there were seminal, seminal articles from, let's say, 1994, they were included at step one. The second step was that the articles needed to be peer-reviewed, written in English. We relied on a large sample size. Anything that had less than 30 kids in it was removed. Again, this is a rubric that was fairly common to the work done in educational syntheses. The articles needed to use a rigorous and quantitative methodology, so we only focused on empirical quantitative studies. We were looking for an experimental or quasi-experimental design. We needed studies that used a wide span of control variables when asking is there a difference of formal versus informal care on school readiness outcomes. Understandably, number five should be fairly obvious. It needed to address children and immigrant families. If it didn't do that, they couldn't be included in the article. We needed to compare formal versus informal care, number six. And I think this is an important point to note, although I think all of my points are important to note. <laughs> But this one is particularly important. There are a lot of articles out there that will study different types of formal care. 
So single language versus bilingual formal care. That wasn't the purpose of this study. This study examined formal care versus informal care. So we did have to cut a lot of studies because they looked at variations of formal care. So Montessori versus not Montessori, et cetera. So we weren't comparing within care options. We were comparing between care options. Pre-kindergarten, prior to school entry in that year just before school entry is really important in the developmental literature. And so we focused on that in particular. And finally, we needed socio-emotional outcomes or academic outcomes measured at school entry or as close as we could get to either a little bit before that, so let's say June, or a little bit after that, let's say October. Does it? Yes. Yep. So four-year-olds. Yep. So let's say let's assume that they go to kindergarten in at five. So let's say that they're four when they're going. Yep. Great question. So after all of that, there were only ten articles that fit this criteria. So even though these are large issues the growing trend of using formal care versus not formal care, even though children from immigrant families are a growing segment of the population, there have only been 10 studies that examined formal versus informal care for children from immigrant families. What this means, as a methodological side note, is that we did not conduct a meta-analysis. Instead, we conducted a synthesis. So most of the articles have focused on academic measures, lining the left side, some articles focused on socio-emotional measures on the right side, and there were two that looked at both. So what are these findings like? So what's interesting about a synthesis presentation is that the results are not tables of numbers. The results instead are the findings from the findings. So let's start with those academic findings. Five of the studies used what's known as the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study Kindergarten Class of 1998. It's an incredible source of data. They track the kids, the National Department of Education, National Center for Educational Statistics, track the kids from kindergarten, first, third, fifth, and eighth grade. So the same kindergarten class. And there was detail about what they did prior to kindergarten. So it's a great source of data, one that I always tell my PhD students they should be using for their dissertations. The second used ECLSK birth cohort. It's a similar analogous idea, only the kids were younger up through kindergarten. And one study used the Tulsa public school system. As I mentioned in the beginning, there are differences in the terms used to define children from immigrant families. And here I put other terms that were used. So we have children in immigrant families defined by primary language, birth country, ch language spoken at home, and child's birth country, so mother's birth country versus child's birth country. As for the outcomes, six examined math, five examined reading and or writing, and two examined English proficiency. And as for the methodology, recall that I said this was a qual quantitative study of quantitative studies. So six used ordinary least squares or logistic regression with statistical controls. One used what's known as hierarchical linear modeling, which accounts for clustering of kids in different groups. And one used regression discontinuity modeling, where you look at different cuts in time and see what happens before and after those cuts. So let's look at these findings. And again, what I said prior is really interesting about a synthesis is that, again, the findings are, in a way, qualitative, because we're looking at what they reported as their findings. So Magnuson and all found that children from immigrant families made greater gains on all academic measures when they were in formal care versus being in informal care. So formal care boosted outcomes for children from immigrant families. And the greatest gains were for those in center-based care that were not Head Start centers. Magnuson and her co-authors wrote another article in 2006, and they found that children in immigrant families had higher English proficiency versus all other children. So not just children in immigrant families versus children in immigrant families in informal care, but children in immigrant families versus every single other child in this data set, the children in immigrant families had the highest English proficiency when in formal care. 
what they did as a really nice test, as I put here as a side note in the second bullet point, is that they looked at children of immigrant families whose mothers spoke a foreign language versus children of immigrant families whose mothers spoke English. So perhaps these families came from English-speaking countries into the United States. And what they found was that it was children from immigrant families whose mother did not speak English when they had the greatest gains. A colleague of mine, Russ Rumberger, and his author Tran in 2006 found, again, positive findings that all children had higher reading and math scores, including children from immigrant families, and that children in immigrant families perform better than staying in informal care and Head Start. The issue with Head Start, it's a little bit tricky because there are socioeconomic issues that come up with Head Start, which may not be apparent when talking about center-based care. So you often find different findings for Head Start than you would for center-based care depending on the socioeconomic status of those kids. And then Gormley in 2008 showed an increase in English, in reading and writing and math for kids in formal care versus informal care. And again, the gains were greatest for kids whose families spoke Spanish in the home or whose parents' birthplace is Mexico. So again, we're seeing some differentiation by the language spoken at home. There were a lot of positive findings. So Basak found that children from immigrant families had higher literacy skills when in formal care compared to children in immigrant families who stayed in informal care. The effects were largest for children in immigrant families compared to white children. And the effects were much larger for children in immigrant families than for Latino children from English speaking homes. So again, we're seeing differentiation in a really nice way in these studies, that children from immigrant families were doing better than even children from, let's say, same race families, but whose parents were born here in the United States. So we're really seeing a boost for these kids from immigrant families. Cannon and her authors found that all children benefited from reading and math, so children from immigrant families and children from native-born parents but they did find the greatest effects for children from what they called linguistically isolated children, uh, linguistically isolated families. And again, this shows evidence of a positive effect for children from immigrant families in particular. And in this final article, what the authors showed was that children from immigrant families had doubled the chances of being English proficient by the start of kindergarten when in formal care versus children in immigrant families who stayed in informal care. And the effects were actually largest for those families who are from lower SES, socioeconomic status levels. So, so far a lot of really great positive evidence. There was one study out of all these studies that did have negative findings. So Krosno found that children from immigrant families did perform worse in math compared to those children in informal care, and they performed worse compared to native white or native Latino students in formal care. Now, as a researcher, I'm gonna take a step back, and I'm gonna critique this article a little bit, and say that they looked at a subgroup of a subgroup in this data set. So I do think it's interesting, without saying any more commentary on that, that everyone else found positive effects, even studies who use the same data set, but that Krosno, he found negative effects. But I think that there's something going on a little bit with the sampling design here. So those were the academic findings. So 90% of these articles found positive effects. How about these socio-emotional findings? So all studies use this ECLS case. So again, this is the data set. That's kindergarten, first, third, fifth, eighth. In kindergarten, we get information about what they were doing in the year before kindergarten. Again, the definitions varied of what it means to be a child from an immigrant family. So to use parents' birth country, to use child's birth country, to use the language spoken at home, one used receipt of English as a second language in school once in kindergarten. The outcomes are social skills and problem behaviors. So these are scales that are in this ECLSK data set that have been corroborated 
by the developmental psychologist as getting at some sort of developmental non-cognitive functioning. And the methodology was somewhat similar. So we saw least squares regression or logistic regression, including lots of controls. We saw one using hierarchical linear modeling, again, to account for kids being in bigger arenas like schools or neighborhoods, et cetera. And we saw one using fixed effects modeling. Okay, so let's go over these results again. So Rumberger, the same Rumberger from before, also looked at socio-emotional outcomes, and we find positive effects. Again, so children in immigrant families were less likely to display problem behaviors when in formal care compared to children in immigrant families who were in informal care. And there was some evidence of higher social skills for children from immigrant families in formal care versus being in informal care. So Krosno, the same Krosno that I just critiqued on the previous slide, found no negative effects for children and immigrant families in informal, informal care. So this is interesting. This is interesting because for the general population, if you remember from the first couple of slides, there was a negative effect on social development for kids in formal care. And here, we're seeing no effect. So if you want to think about a line going down, for the general population, what we're seeing for the kids in formal care is a flattening. So in a way, no effect is actually a good thing in this scenario. And then this crazy professor named Gottfried in 2014 found that children in immigrant families had higher social skills scores when in formal care versus being in informal care. And something that the other articles didn't do is that I looked at how much is a good thing. And what I found was that between 15 and 30 hours of formal care was the best compared to, of course, zero, compared to one to 15 hours and compared to 30 plus hours. There was one study that found mixed findings. I'm not gonna go through all of these points in detail, but what this study did was look at different race different language of children in immigrant families. So Asian children in immigrant families, black children in immigrant families, Spanish-speaking children in immigrant families. And what they find is mixed effects, that for some times it mattered for some groups, and for other groups it didn't matter sometimes. And again, I put a personal caveat. Because like Krosno in 2007, who used the same data set, I'm concerned that what they did was they're looking at a subsection of a subsection of a subsection. In this case, the subsection would be children and immigrant families, the subsection might be race, and the subsection of that might be language. So I'm not sure that this data set has the power to detect the effects that these authors anticipated that they would find. Same with Krosno. So those are the results for the first two research questions. The first research question, we see mostly positive findings except for the one article that I mentioned. For the socio-emotional effects, we see mostly positive findings, with perhaps a little bit of a caveat from this last slide. But then the third research question asked, what are the limitations that the authors themselves raised? Are there commonalities among the limitations? So the biggest limitation of any limitation that was in any of the studies was quality. These are quantitative studies and we can ask, what's the effect of formal care versus informal care? And you add a variable that's called, I was in formal care. But what these articles couldn't get at is why. What's going on in formal care that would boost academic and socio-emotional outcomes, particularly for children from immigrant families? So that's a big deal. We don't have any of the mechanisms as to why. We've established what is, but we don't know why. The second limitation is that, have we measured school readiness? Are we sure that these tests, academic tests and developmental tests, are capturing the right readiness? So one problem is that if the tests were in English, are we really testing readability for kids who don't speak English proficiently? But if the tests were in Spanish, how do you measure English proficiency? And as for socio-emotional skills, they're subjective. They're teacher rated. They're ratings of one through five frequently versus never. How do we know those are objective enough 
to say something about socio-emotional development, getting past subjectivity of the teachers and any sort of biases they may have. A third limitation was this lack of being able to analyze these subgroups. So analyzing children from immigrant families of a certain race speaking a certain language was not possible in any of these data sets. They all recognize this, that doing a subgroup of a subgroup of a subgroup is not possible. So we can't really get out region of the US. We couldn't get at urban versus suburban. We can't really get at Spanish home language versus other non-English home language. And we can't get at timing from any of these articles. When did the families move to the US? Was the child two? Was the child four? Did the child immediately go into pre-kindergarten coming from another country? We don't know. It's impossible to tell from these data. And one limitation that I'm still on the fence on whether or not this is a real limitation is that these studies end at kindergarten entry. Although these studies set out to study kindergarten entry. So I don't know if we should fault themselves as harshly as some of these authors did. But we don't know anything about long-term effects from these studies. We don't know if the gaps close over time, if these effects peter out. We just don't know. So then what are the implications? So generally, we see positive effects across these studies. So formal pre-kindergarten care does seem to be an option to boost both academic school readiness as well as socio-emotional school readiness, as long as you're willing to accept that these measures capture something about readiness. So a policy implication from this synthesis is to continue supporting endeavors that would promote formal pre-kindergarten care attendance for children from immigrant families, as well as children from native-born parents. But the second policy implication is that we need more detail. What is it about formal pre-kindergarten care? We need to know more about quality. This will help us develop effective programs, but I think another very important point is that what about those kids that don't go to formal pre-kindergarten care? Are there aspects of formal pre-kindergarten care that we can induce into form informal pre-kindergarten care? So what characteristics are scalable to those children who will not ever end up in formal pre-kindergarten care? So I would encourage the support of data collection that measures quality. I think we can establish that there seems to be positive effects of formal pre-kindergarten care, but we don't know why. I would encourage partnering with the city or district to conduct both a quantitative and a qualitative analysis to really get at the mechanisms. And finally, data. As a quant guy, I have to talk about data. So large data are important, and I do think that the studies relied on very valuable data. It's possible to emulate causality you can include many, many variables. You can draw generalizations. You can have a lot more power in these analyses than you can with small samples. And what's important is by having a lot of different types of data, you can have a generalizability. The fact that all of these studies using different data came to the same conclusions really strengthens the argument for formal pre-kindergarten care. So I would continue supporting the development of large-scale data, but I would continue supporting the development of longitudinal data. So a lot of these data sets are up to kindergarten or starting kindergarten through grade eight, but we don't have anything that really captures the experience through high school, through college. So we don't get any of these transitions to see how great of an effect is formal pre-kindergarten care in that year before kindergarten. And with that, I leave it open for a bit of Q&A. Thank you. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Rick Simpson. He is the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Speaker of the California Assembly, Tony Atkins. In that capacity, Rick is responsible for advising the Speaker and other members of the Assembly on a wide variety of policy and budget issues. Rick has spent more than 36 years working in and around the State Capitol, primarily on issues of public education. He served as senior advisor for eight assembly speakers and has staffed the education committees in both the assembly and the Senate. In 1999, Rick served in Governor Gray Davis's cabinet as his first legislative secretary. 
Rick is one of California's experts on education policy and school finance. He's either written or played a key role in developing most of California's major education reforms of the past three decades. Rick is the Assembly's lead negotiator on the annual budget for public education. He will now introduce the other panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Simpson. Thank, thanks, Rich. Um, uh, with me today, uh, Susanna Cooper, longtime friend. Uh, Susanna is a consultant who uses her expertise in education policy, legislative strategy, and communications to help organizations improve public education and the well-being of children. For eight years, Susanna was senior education advisor to Senate President Pro Tem Daryl Steinberg, shaping and shepherding the legislative agenda of one of the most productive education-focused leaders in recent memory. A little sidelight, we trained him in the assembly before he went to the Senate, so we'll take a little bit of credit. I had to retrain him. We'll, yeah, we'll take a little bit of credit for that. Uh, she's also served as a visiting journalism fellow at, at the PPIC, as director of communications for a nonprofit organization focused on early education. She's also a writer, editorial, and uh, edit, editor and editorial board member for the Sacramento Bee. That's where I think she and I first met, where she was responsible for the newspaper's editorial positions on public schools and children's issues. Uh, Susanna has been recognized by Early Edge California for her legislative accomplishments in early childhood education, by the California Association of School Counselors for her successful work to change the accountability system for public high schools, and by Youth Acting Together uh, for giving voice to the needs of teenagers in Sacramento region. So uh, join me in welcoming Susanna. Uh, Vicki Ramos Harris is the State Director of Policy and Practice for Early Edge California, where she also leads their um, policy agenda on birth to third grade um, issues. She previously served as Chief of Staff to Board Vice President Yoli Flores of uh, LA Unified School District. She spent her career focused on education through direct service with children and families, community-based school reform efforts, supporting dual language learners and family engagement in Boston, New York City, and Los Angeles, as well as education research, policy, and advocacy in early childhood and K-12 education. Vicki holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from Pomona College, educational master's degree from Harvard uh, University Graduate School of Education, a small, not too well-known university back in uh, the East Coast somewhere. Um, Bruce didn't give me his bio, so I have the liberty of being able to pick out things from his, from his CV. Uh, Bruce is a professor of education and public policy at uh, UC Berkeley, teaching education policy, political theory, and sociology of education. He got his PhD at Stanford, another little university down the road that had a pretty mediocre fencing team. <laughs> um, uh, Bruce, uh, at one point, was a research sociologist for uh, the World Bank, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, also spent some uh, time at Harvard, I think it said. Um, uh, the most interesting thing to me was um, in 1981 and 82, Bruce was a special assistant to the governor of the state of California, who happened to be the same governor we have now. Uh, what goes around comes around. <laughs> Uh, and then in, from the mid-70s to the late 70s, he was an education advisor uh, to the state legislature, the Assembly Ways and Means Education Subcommittee, and the Committee on Higher Education. Um, he did that until 1978, so he and I actually may have overlapped for a short while on legislative staff. So again, uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Susanna, Vicki, and Bruce. So um, I'm just going uh, to... We I want to make this as much of a conversation um, as we can, so I'll just throw out a couple of um, thoughts to maybe prompt some discussion. First of all, um, whenever I hear these kinds of, of research analyses, um, I like to know, is this a big deal or a little deal? That is, uh, is this, are these differential effects, I assume they're statistically significant, but is this a, a big deal or just a statistically significant uh, little deal. So that's kind of one of one of them. We've been hearing about um, the positive effects of early learning opportunities, pre-K um, opportunities, for decades, um, and we've based you know our um, some of our budget decisions about expanding preschool opportunities on studies that suggest that the benefits relative to the cost are three, four, five, seven times as many benefits in the out years as, as the cost in the early years. So um, is this just a 
Well, duh. I mean, we've known that for every, you know, for, for kids generally. Is this, is this kind of new information? And, and how, do we, how do we sort of put this in perspective? Bruce? <laughs> uh, we'll just get the ball rolling. I, I think there are a couple really interesting findings in Michael's paper. One is that there are social emotional benefits of pre-K for this immigrant subgroup. Uh, as he mentioned, there's been a debate over the last 15 years over whether pre-K actually advances kids' social skills or or uh, or slows them down. Uh, the uh, the NICHD, the National Institutes of Health, did a major tracking study and found this negative effect. It was small, but received a lot of attention in the press. And I think Michael's work dispels the notion that there is a negative effect, at least for this population. And secondly, the dosage effect, so to speak, that he went through quickly. Uh, these effects are bigger uh, if you're in pre-K more than half day, but not more than 30 hours a week. I think, I think that's significant, because there are advocates out there that say, the more pre-K, the better. You know, uh, we can hold these kids in here for, for 12, 14 hours a day. They'll be doing better than at home. So I think, I think sort of trying to hone in on what, uh, what level of care for how long and how to balance that with care back in the home is a, is a, is a big significant finding. Interesting. Vicki, Susanna? Um, so in general, again, I agree with, with Bruce about um, the importance of particularly around dosage um, and how the nuances of what populations benefit and to what extent. Um, so the English proficiency, I think, is an important one. And the questions raised about, you know, if children are tested in English, how, to what extent do we know what they know if they're not being tested in their home language? And there's no reason why we can't do both. Um, and we would learn more about what their home language um, skills um, offer them in terms of content <coughs> learning and those kinds of things. Um, and I think in terms of quality, and especially since we don't really know the type of quality in these programs, um, but some of the nuances in this art, in, in this research also share a, a little bit about um, the kind of professional development we might want, want to focus on. So things like culturally relevant and responsive curriculum, teaching and learning, um, strategies of supporting dual language learners, and um, social emotional development, and and ensuring that teachers across across all programs in early education, whether it's Head Start or state preschool, um, that there is a strong background and strong training in, the, in those areas so that um, we are reaping the benefits that we know in high quality early childhood education programs do lead to um, improved outcomes also in social emotional development. Susanna, thoughts? Uh, so I, I agree with all of what's come before. I think it's a very important study and compliment Dr. Gottfried on it, um, especially so for California. And he, one of his slides mentioned, but I just wanted to underscore that um, here in California, 50% of the child population is living in an immigrant family, which is double the rate or the percentage nationally. So um, for us to, to see a synthesis with findings that are this strong, and you know, by the way, I'm not, I can't recall any piece of education synthesis that found that 90% and then 100% of studies agreed about anything. So, so to me, that was really striking mm -hmm. um, and sort of underscores the importance of, of what he found. And you know, there is a little bit of, um, I think for people like us who are following uh, early education research, there's a little bit of, well, duh, it's good for immigrant, for kids in immigrant families, right? Um, but on the other hand, there's a lot of sort of up and down, little bits and pieces that you get over the decade. Um, you know, Bruce mentioned some earlier studies of, of uh, not of this particular subgroup that had different findings around socio socio-emotional benefits or negative outcomes. Um, it's a little bit like the advice you get from researchers about whether and how much coffee you should be drinking, right? It's like you're trying to follow the ball and you can't, you just need somebody to pull it together for you and tell you you know, here's what the body of, of evidence shows us, and I, I think Michael has done that, and for California, it's um, incredibly important. So, um, you know, the people I work for are the ones who have to write the checks for um, state support for um, the pre-K programs we have, and if we want to expand it. 
So one thing they're going to want to know is, well, if, if we're going to be investing more money, is how um, is this a big enough deal to invest a, a specific amount of money? And that is, you talk somewhat about effect sizes and talk about standard deviations. Um, I think like the median was something like two tenths of a standard deviation was that was the effect size. Is that something to make us sit up and take notice, or is that Oh, that's like a teeny weeny little thing. It may be positive, but but is that enough to make us change our investment? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Just quickly say it's bigger than lowering class size. <laughs> I looked it up and it's not. <laughs> I looked it up. That's between 0.2 and 0.3 standard deviations. I know you did. I know you did. But I actually looked it up last night. Okay. All right. I know you well, said I, it. I I think that a two tenths of a standard deviation is significant. From other work that I've done, I find much lower effect sizes for a, of a lot of research questions. So in the work that Rich mentioned on pure effects that I do, we don't get anywhere near that effect sizes. So someone did a very small synthesis within the, their larger empirical work on pure effects to keep going down that strand. Mm -hmm. And they find lar the largest pure effects are 0.06 of peer-to-peer -peer interaction in quantitative studies. So to find something like 0.2 I think is is fairly large, but but I agree that the question is okay. Now what? Right. How do, what do we think about quality? But then what do we think about dosage? I think those are two really important questions, not just for the outcomes of the students, but also for education, finance, and policy. Right. What do you what do you do? You do fifteen hours a week. Is that the biggest boost, or is thirty hours? And that obviously has implications for writing the check. So I think it's a big deal, but I think that we need more. Well, to know how much. I mean, that, that's part of what we yeah. have to trade off, quality versus quantity. Yeah. If we have mm -hmm. a limited amount of money, we can serve, you know, lots of kids at a presumably a lower quality, but or more kids at a higher quality because how do we how do we how should we think about that trade off? Well, quickly, Rick, I'd say the the professional community, the early childhood community in California, I think is shifting towards quality and away from supply uh, and access. And Michael's work <coughs> reminds us that we still have an access problem for this population. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know, you're in Fresno County or Bakersfield or South Oakland, and you might have a third of these kids enrolled in, in center-based care. So I think it's, he's kind of maybe inadvertently <laughs> giving us a word of warning, too, that before we just all move over to the quality conversation, uh, for this population, we've got a huge access yeah. issue. That's bad. So a couple of thoughts. Um, one on dosage, because I think that those findings are really important. This but is not a vaccine conversation. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, so you know. but the, I mean, the, the conversation in this context about dosage is a little bit of a luxury, because mm -hmm. we have so many families in, you know, in the in the state and nationally who really don't have a choice about not having their children in their care for what you know whatever the hours are they need to work full time they need to work more than full time potentially just to make it so um, while yes we might really want to we might have this finding that we want them in care or in informal setting less than 30 hours a week that's not a reality for their parents so so the question is how do we manage both the practical context with what the, the research is showing the, to your question about um, what does it tell the people who write the checks? Um, so the legislature and the governor have um, done a very dramatic thing in completely rewriting the system of school finance for, for the K-12 system and have made, I think, a very important decision to focus significant additional resources on children who are still learning English, um, which is primarily the same population that Michael is looking at, um, and have made that decision that this population is in need of extra resources starting in kindergarten, um, by which time there's already a school readiness gap yeah. present. Um, I think you know, what we're hearing about today really adds to the, the sense of urgency around making sure that those resources start to flow earlier. And that's begun, but there's a lot of work yet to be done. Mm -hmm. Vicki, where should we head? Well, in terms of, I think the access question is an important one and the quality I mean so last year we were able to invest in 50 million dollars for the quality rating improvement system as an overlay to the expansion process so I think everyone would you know families who really need their child to be in high quality care are going to uh, we 
there's not a shortage of them, and how we get to uh, reach as many families as possible, particularly low-income families who are going to have the greatest benefit. We really need to continue the, growing the access, but the layering of the quality is is just as important. And so, I you know, expansion too quickly without looking at that, I think, is problematic. And so we need to grow them together and think about how we leverage the systems that are already in place. Um, so we have those across the state, and how do we leverage federal dollars for those things in the federal conversation on quality? Um, Bruce, what would you, I mean, um, at some point, legislature, governor, school districts, um, community organizations, um, what does this study suggest the kind of policy directions we ought to be taking? Is it, is it um, perhaps, um, pre-K uh, programs targeted for this particular population? Should we give a priority to this particular population on, in expansions we're doing anyway? Um, how, how does it inform our decision making about, about pre-K yeah. policy? Uh, good question, Rick. Um, I think at a first level, it does raise the issue of how to target scarce resources. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some of the new expansion money that the governor and the legislature approved in part because of Rick's leadership on the assembly side um, and Susanna's thinking on the Senate side, um, a lot of this expansion money started to go out to counties with the strongest capacity and infrastructure like San Francisco, um, LA, San Diego, and in some ways that's smart because you want to spend the money wisely. On the other hand, it's the Fresnos, the Bakersfields, the Modestos that really have a severe access problem. So I think we already have get more. Right, yeah. right. So we've got to think about this building capacity at the same time we're trying to move money out when, when there's new money. And, and I think secondly is this issue of what, what's the magic inside these centers? Uh, Michael kept coming back to this in the paper in terms of what is the mechanism inside. I think a lot of, and Vicki spoke to this, a lot of the mechanism is language socialization or essentially um, making kids more fluent in English. Um, but we have to understand that better, and I think we also have to think about it in a, in a, in a critical way, because it, we have this paradox where, where, because of Michael's work and others, we know that these centers are effective in moving kids towards English. At the other hand, on the other hand, a lot of parents are not enrolling their kids in centers. And that's an interesting mystery. And there's a little bit of anthropological work on this where, uh, where some of us go out and just hang out with, with Latina moms for a year or 14 months. And sometimes they say things like, well, if my kid goes into a center with white kids, they, they get to be too rude. <laughs> they get to be too individualistic. They're asking me all sorts of questions all the time. And that's not how I want to raise my child. <laughs> so I, I think as we, and, and of course, language is part of continuing your own community. And, and, and um, we talk about linguistically isolated communities. But if you grew up as a kid in East LA, you're not linguistically isolated speaking Spanish. Right. You're a full member of your community. So. Um, I think as we try to figure out what the magic is in these centers, we've got to be careful because we're, we're messing with how families are raising their kids, not our kids. Um, so that, that, that's hard for policymakers to kind of deal sure. with, although certainly Vicki and others are encouraging a broader kind of dialogue about how do we construct public action in terms of helping families raise their kids. Um, so to Bruce's point about prior to the prioritization, as we look at expansion, one of the questions we're looking at is also, where is the highest unmet need? Um, and so uh, communities like San Bernardino County, Riverside County, the rural areas, and what is the infrastructure we need to support in those communities where the you might have very little uh, school districts, because most of those are going to be mixed um, delivery systems. So you're going to have family child care providers, as well as uh, formal settings, um, center-based center care. So really, as we look at expansion, really wanting to make sure that we're looking at the areas with the highest unmet need and having conversations locally with, um, on how to build the infrastructure so that when the expansion reaches them, they're ready. Um, so um, I think looking at prioritization that way is important. And then to your point about families, um, parent, family, I'm sorry, family school partnerships, even at the level of center-based care I think is super important and we need to uh, do more of um, so that there is an understanding of the cultural cross-sections that are happening when families are bringing 
their children to a center that is going to have a different culture uh, in the classroom and learning how is it that I can support my child's learning in a way that makes sense to me, whether I'm literate, whether I can or, can or cannot speak English. Um, so, and those kinds of family school partnerships, I think that's the best time to encourage those because once there's, they're navigating through the system and it feels positive, you, you're not looking for them in high school anymore. <laughs> they're there. And so how, to the extent that we can build those, that culture early on with the families, I think is important. So, uh, Michael, the um, uh, Women's Caucus in both the Senate and the Assembly placed um, a high priority on early learning opportunities, expanding child care, preschool, pre-K kinds of opportunities. Um, if you could give them one piece of advice that flows out of your um, synthesis of the studies and an appropriate answer is not more research is needed. <laughs> um, but that further me. <laughs> yeah. um, what what kind of advice would you would you give them for how to think about expanding um, these kinds of opportunities for kids? So I would first say that continue supporting these opportunities. So the research shows that these opportunities are important. But again, to, to harp on the same things I've been saying is we need to know the mechanisms. What are you going to support if you continue supporting this? To say that you support formal pre-kindergarten care, center-based pre-kindergarten care, what does that mean? Could be any of a range of... Right, yeah. exactly. What are, what are the mechanisms that you're supporting? I think that's what's important to determine is what is it about these centers that's so, that you think is so important that we need to continue? Is it teacher quality? Is it le or is it learning from the teacher? Is it the socialization with other kids? Is it language development? What is it that's so important? And to find that out, more research. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. Okay. It was all a setup was, just okay. to get back to that. Okay. Okay. Yes. Well, I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll conclude. But before we do, I'd like to thank once again uh, Rick Simpson for moderating the panel, our panelists Bruce Fuller, Vicki Ramos-Harris, Susanna Cooper, our presenter, Professor Michael Gottfried, um, Kevin Bacon, who made this all possible, and you in the audience for staying engaged with us. Thank you very much.